Okay, hello everyone. Uh, thanks very much for joining us. Um, I'm Duncan Pritchard. I'm the um, uh, director of the Center for Knowledge, Technology, and Society. I'm sorry for the slightly late start. We uh, we're having some technical uh, hiccups, but uh, I think we've got it sorted now. So I'm delighted to welcome um, Professor Mona Simeon from the University of Glasgow, uh, who is going to be who is today is uh, giving the annual center lecture. Uh, She's uh, got a very distinguished uh, CV. She's a professor of philosophy at the University of Glasgow. She runs the uh, Cogito Research Center there, which uh, has been doing incredible work. Uh, it's been quite cool to see the, uh, the sort of the, the 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 center of gravity, as it were, in terms of uh, of world epistemology shift shift westwards towards Glasgow over the last few years, and that's uh, a lot to do with uh, uh, the the work of Monastone and her colleagues. Uh, among her many distinctions, lots of uh, phenomenal grants, uh, winner of the Young Epistemologist Prize in 2011, um, published uh, a lot of uh, great books, um, most recently Shifty Speech and Independent Thought, and uh, with Chris Kelp, Sharing Knowledge, a Functionalist Account of Assertion, the first books of University Press and the second with uh, Cambridge University Press. So, delighted to... Uh, to have her join us today, and she's going to be talking to us about knowledge and disinformation. Oh, sorry, Mona, you're, mu you're muted. I was just apologizing. My internet uh, went away while you were talking. I gather that you can hear me now. Yes. Um, yeah, good, great. Thanks a lot for having me. Yeah, so this paper is going to be a bit strange in that somehow the exegetic part is going to be uh, not what, what you'd expect in that it's not only going to cover um, philosophy, philosophical literature and things in the vicinity, uh, but rather what I'm going to try to do is look at what has been said about the nature of this information across disciplines, because surprisingly, even though obviously it's such a hot uh, topic and it has such high uh, stakes for our lives, uh, research in the nature of disinformation um, is not uh, a whole lot in any uh, discipline. We have some work uh, done in philosophy by Don Fallis, but for the most part, uh, disinformation uh, is a topic that hasn't been, you know, the the subject of uh, hot research because people have assumed uh, roughly that disinformation is um, a species of information. First of all, i.e. the false variety species of information. So people have assumed that information uh, is non-factive, that there are two varieties thereof, true and false, and that this information in particular is the false variety of information that is spread around intentionally or with the function um, to mislead. So uh, this, this is pretty much this, dictionary definition has pretty much been assumed across fields. So then people put most of the work in uh, analyzing the nature of information, thinking that we get the nature of this information for free uh, from then onwards. So let's change slide. Uh, what we're gonna do uh, today is basically identify the main uh, claims that have been defended in the literature, in philosophy, computer science, media studies, um, and information science uh, about this information, and then group them into what I will call disinformation orthodoxy. But note that it's not even uh, clear to me that that's a, a proper term to use methodologically, given that it's orthodoxy across fields. So the one orthodox uh, researcher to another, they might not know that they exist. Um, and I'm going to say that all the claims that have been uh, assumed in disinformation orthodoxy, unfortunately, are false. So we need to start from scratch. We have no account of disinformation whatsoever. Um, if I'm right, and I really unfortunately suspect I'm not far from the truth on this front, we need to start analyzing this information from scratch. So that, that's what I've done, and that's what I'm going to do in the second part of the talk, where I'm going to try to offer my preferred account of this information in my preferred normative uh, framework and show you that it has a bunch of advantages. And then I'm gonna conclude by explaining why we should care about this. 
Again, if I'm at least roughly right, uh, it follows that we have no tools, AIs or non-AIs, to protect us from this information uh, this day. So we thought, you know, in, in the field of information research, we, we thought that we made progress because we have, you know, companies that do fact-checking. We have now very spe specialized AIs that do fact-checking. So we thought that you know, if we are not protected uh, from this information, that's a question more of policy rather than of uh, capacity. If I'm right, it is also a question of capacity. So we need to start from scratch, not only in the theorizing about this information, but also in theorizing about how to build tools that are actually efficiently protecting us against it. So let's change, change slides, please. All right. So as I said, these assumptions are not assumptions present merely in philosophy, but rather widely endorsed across fields. Uh, as I mentioned already, many people in the literature assume, with very few exceptions, assume that information uh, is not a factive notion, that there are good and bad varieties thereof, truth and true and false, and that this information is the false and intentionally misleading variety. Uh, of information. There are exceptions to this, most notably Dretsky and more recently uh, Luciano Floridi have uh, put forth factive accounts of information, but with, with this very few exceptions, um, literature has assumed that information is not a factive notion and thereby this information is a species thereof. So on this account, basically, the cat is on the mat, carries the information the cat is on the mat in virtue of the fact that it means that the cat is on the mat. It doesn't matter whether the cat is on the mat or not. And then this information consists in spreading the cat is on the mat in spite, in spite of knowing it to be false and with the intention uh, or function to mislead. Um, this Here I'm not ambiguating. Uh, for the longest time, the definition that was assumed was the dictionary definition that features intention. More recently, Don Fallis uh, wrote a paper where he says, well, it doesn't really need to be intention to deceive. After all, we have, for instance, AIs that spread this information. Unless we want to think of AIs um, uh, as having such fancy mental states as intentions, we might want to uh, you know, have a disjunctive view where it can be an intention or a function in the case of artifacts spreading this information. Slide. So why do people believe this? Um, why, why do people take this notion of information to be um, non-factive and thereby disinformation to be a species thereof? So as far as I could tell in the literature, there are two rationales that are put forth for this assumption. One is the practical rationale. And I think this was a good rationale in its time. So the practical rationale has to do with work in computer science and information science on this information that that's the, an information that dates back uh, to the 70s. Uh, for these people, um, what they say is, look, for me, factivity doesn't matter. Um, what matters for the information scientist is how, many, how much data can be packed into a signal, or at least that's what mattered in the 70s, right? So before coming to philosophy, I went to journalist school, and we were taught the Shannon model of information and of information transfer. And what the Shannon model does, it explains how you know, you can, via a channel, you can take a particular amount of information and transmits it, and it predicts how much, what the, what quantity you get, uh, as it were. And you can see why that's important in the 70s when we're trying to build computers and transmit uh, information uh, via uh, whatever various um, compute, computing uh, methods, right? Now... The problem for this practical rationale, of course, is that it's outdated, right? So we, our main problem now is not how to build computers, we're rather good at that, not how to transmit information, we're rather good at that as well. Um, our problem now is the infodemic. Our problem is how to, you know, make sure that we protect uh, ourselves uh, from believing falsehoods and acting in bad ways in virtue of believing falsehoods because we are misled by our sources, right? So the president of the World Health Organization, for instance, dubs the situation that we're facing an infodemic. Um, in virtue of this infodemic, it, uh, what we see across fields 
um, is uh, an increased interest in researching and developing automatic algorithmic detection of misinformation and disinformation, right? And we also see, you know, huge grants acquired by epistemologists to help um, people, computer scientists do this. So in the practical rationale was good uh, in the 70s. It doesn't work anymore. We need an account um, of this information that's the correct one, and we need um, a factive notion of information. The, the second rationale, uh, let's move slides. The second rationale is the philosophically interesting one. So people think, many people across fields really, think that natural language gives us clear hints to the non-factivity of information. Now, this might be my linguistic limitations. I come from a Romance language. For me, the thought of false information just never worked. It, it, it doesn't ring well at all. But of course, linguistic intuitions vary uh, widely across languages, so I'm, I'm not going to rely on that. Uh, but the thought, let's see the examples that are put forth to see if they actually su support um, a non-factive notion of information. So here are the examples that are taken to support non-factivity. The thought is, well, the following things seem perfectly fine to say. The media is spreading a lot of fake information. The library contains a lot of information. Uh, but if, the, if it is fine to say the media is spreading a lot of fake information, it's got to be that there is such a thing as fake information. Therefore, information can be fake. It doesn't need to be factive. That's the thought. Or surely all libraries contain some falsehoods, thereby uh, we shouldn't be able to say uh, that the library contains a lot of information. Now, of course, those of you who do a bit of philosophy will have already noticed that there are obvious problems with these arguments. The, the, the most obvious is that, that there being some false content in a library is perfectly compatible with it containing a good amount of information alongside it. So the claim the library contains a lot of information is perfectly compatible with there being a lot of misinformation uh, in the library. So this, this, the naturalness of this assertion doesn't tell us anything about the factivity or non-factivity of information. Notice though, that it wouldn't sound quite right to say the library contains a lot of information in a case in which we would know for sure that it's filled with falsehoods. But if information is non-factive, it, it's strange. It, but to me, it seems as though if I were to say, for instance, about the library of the Romanian Communist Party uh, during you know, the uh, bad days of the Iron Curtain, that it contains a lot of information, I, my assertion would surely be challenged by my connationals. That library contained absolutely no, uh, no truth. So it seems to me as though, if anything, this intuition is going to go the other way around. Let's change slides. The, but more importantly, living, I, mean, I think that the library examples was just a mistake in the literature, to be honest. But here is, um, here is something that's maybe harder to track. The claim that if information can take fake, it follows that there is such a thing as a species of information which is fake, therefore information is not factive, right? So this is a, it, this is a, you know, a less trivial mistake, let's put it like that. Uh, what I'm going to argue uh, in the next minutes is that natural language at best cannot decide the factivity issue either way, and at worst, and I think de facto, suggests information is factive. So it is common knowledge in formal semantics that when, when a complex expression consists of an intentional modifier and a modified expression, then we cannot infer a type-species relation, right? And why is that? Well, because some modifiers are privative. So here are a few examples, uh, paradigmatic examples of privative modifiers. Fake, indeed, former, spurious. These modifiers are privative, where what that means is that they license inference to not X rather than to X. So that's why we can't infer a type species relation just because uh, we have an intentional modifier that modifies an expression. Because some intentional modifiers are privative. They predict non X, right? So take, for instance, former husband. My former husband is not um, my husband. Take fake gold. Fake gold is not gold. So privative modifiers do not predict uh, type species relation. To the contrary, they predict uh, lack of type species uh, relation. So the fact that information takes fake as modifier, which is a priv paradigmatic uh, um, privative modifier, suggests, if anything, that information is fact in that fake acts as a privative. You need a privative in order to designate that 
what you get when you say fake information is something false, right? So the data, I want to say, at, at best doesn't decide the issue, but in, in my view, it decides it quite well on the other on the other side of the debate. Let's move slides. Now, furthermore, I want to argue natural language semantics gives us further direct reason to be skeptical about this information being a species of information. And here is why. Um, several instances, there are several instances of this prefix properties that fail to signal type species relations. And indeed, um, going, going back uh, to my preferred topic about uh, Romance languages, um, the closest the re Romance language is to Latin, the less likely it is that a, a, an expression prefixed by this is going to signal a type species relation. Uh, so, you know, for take this for what it may be worth, uh, you know, I'm not myself a big fan of natural language philosophy, but insofar as the only motivation that is presented by the people who people who think that information is not active and this information is a species thereof has to do with natural language that I need to play the game and say, no, actually, if we examine natural language, what we get is the other way around. So classical, again, paradigmatic, this prefix cases are things like this barring, which is obviously not a way of becoming a member of the bar, no type species relation. This pleasing is not a form of pleasing. This placing is not a form of placing, and so on. There are exceptions, but again, we're talking natural language-based um, arguments here. So I guess what, what matters for our argument here is whether we have a good reason to believe that there is a type species relation here. And I want to say, if anything, natural language suggests that it isn't. Slide, please. Here is a second assumption that is very, very, uh, you know, popular in the literature, uh, maybe much more so than the previous assumption. So while in the literature of information, there's, there are still people who fight the good fight, who think that information is factive, a couple of them, uh, I am still to find someone who doesn't endorse this claim, the claim that this information is a species of misinformation. Again, roughly, if we look at the dictionary definition, the way in which people think about this is information is non-factive, misinformation is a species that thereof, the false species, and this information is in misinformation spread intentionally, right? So the difference between misinformation and disinformation is this intentional spreading or the function of to mislead uh, by uh, Don Fallis. So here are a, a couple of problems with this assumption. So while I agree that misinformation is essentially false content, uh, the mis prefix, the reason why I agree is because it makes sense, again, natural language based, right? So the mis prefix in all the possible languages that have them um, modifies as badly or wrongly or unfavorably, opposite or lack of, or even not, right? So you would expect if information is factive that what you're going to get um, is false content when you have something that's prefixed with mis, right? So if information is factive, it makes sense. Um, that misinformation is going to be false content, right? So in this, misinformation is essentially non-information, right? In the same way in which fake gold is essentially non-gold. As opposed to this, however, for the most part, this modifies as deprive of, so not, a, not as non, not as the opposite of, but as deprive of a specified quality, rank, or object, right? To exclude or to expel of, right? So it doesn't paradigmatically negate the prefix content, but rather it signals some variety of undoing, right? So misplacing is not, uh, is placing in the wrong place. Displacing, however, is not a type of, of placing, right? It's taking out of the right place, right? So in this, displacing is not a species of misplacing. You can displace something and not place it anywhere, right? Thereby not misplacing it, right? So this... This does not signal a species of miss, as it were, because miss signal a non, while this signals an undoing. You take something away, as it were. Let's change slides. 
Another problem is that this information, as opposed to misinformation, it, uh, is not essentially false, right? So unless we want to have a very technical notion of this information where we just stipulate that it is essentially false, I think that it is a mistake to, to have such a narrow notion because I think the, the more subtle and more successful disinformation campaign that we really want to adopt this information campaign because otherwise this notion is of no, no help to us are not done via falsehoods, right? So I can, for instance, disinform you via asserting true content and generating a false implicature. That's a classical way to do propaganda, right? Um, so, you know, I can disinform you about um, Climate change, for instance, if I'm a journalist, by showing up on TV and saying there is disagreement in science about climate change. Now, that's strictly speaking true. I bet there are a couple of crazy scientists uh, somewhere in, in a village in the middle of nowhere that disagree that climate change is happening. Compatibly, however, when you come on, on TV and you say there is disagreement in science about climate change, there is a relevance implicature triggered, right? What's the relevance to the news? Well, it's relevant only if it's newsworthy. Therefore, the disagreement's got to be significant. Otherwise, Otherwise, why are we talking about it on TV, right? So when you come and assert there is disagreement in science about climate change, you know, innocent, unprepared audiences are likely to, to hear the implicature, their significant disagreement in science about climate change, and thereby throw their hands in the air and suspend belief on the topic. You will have thereby disinformed your audience about climate change without asserting anything false. I want to point out that this is the classic way to do propaganda. Again, going back to my journalist school years, um, funnily enough, we were uh, taught a course called Theories of Manipulation, allegedly in order to be able to defend ourselves from them. I, I am, there is still an open question whether we were taught in order to defend ourselves from them or in order to be able to do it. But what I can tell you is that this is the first chapter, how to, um, how to do it via implicature. So, you know, it's also not very clever to do it via falsehood because people are not that stupid, right? The, the clever way to do it is by asserting truths that imply falsehoods, right? And here is a, finally another problem for this uh, type sp uh, species claim between uh, misinformation and disinformation. It seems to me as though information and, dis and misinformation exist out there, right? Whether I, I uptake it or not information exists out there, as does misinformation, right? However, this information seems to be, to some extent, more us-dependent. It seems as though if we all die, there is no disinformation anymore uh, to be found in the world because there's nobody that can be the subject of uh, of this uh, disinformation, right? So this seems to suggest that the, this information is somehow essentially second person or audience involving. If that is the case, again, the type species, there is there is doubt uh, being uh, shed on the type species relation. Slide. Okay, so what we've seen so far is that information is factive, and so thereby the assumption that this information is a species of information is mistaken, that this information is not a species of misinformation as it has been assumed. Misinformation is false content. This information doesn't need to be false. However, what it needs is some sort of audience, or at least some disposition to capture an audience. Uh, and here is the last assumption that's popular. I was telling you that uh, people think that this information is basically misinformation spread intentionally or with the function uh, to deceive. Uh, and this is a very problematic practically uh, assumption, uh, especially since it's false, as I'm about to argue, because I was talking to a, uh, to a colleague in the US actually at Miami who is a political scientist who works on conspiracy theories, and he was saying that the move in political science is to go to move away from trying to defend people from disinformation uh, when they work with computer scientists to, to put together whatever fact checkers. There's a tendency to, to move away from disinformation trackers because the thought is, well, disinformation implies intention, but we can't track intentions. That's very hard to use. Uh, therefore, we should just try to to track misinformation. What, why that would be dangerous? Well, if I'm right and this information is not a species of, mis of misinformation, doesn't need to be false, it is much more widely spread, right? So here are a few simple problems for this, um, uh, for this claim. Um, just uh, only a second, I need to plug in my computer. Just a second.
sorry about that. Um, yes, as I was saying, so the, the thought, here are a couple of cases that should warm you up to the thought that this information cannot possibly be essentially intentional or functional, or at least that we shouldn't think about it in this way, because if we do, we miss very important, crucial cases. Uh, we miss disinformation campaigns, some, and, and that is you know, uh, not the kind of notion that we need. So here is a one problem case. Take a black box AI that in the absence of any intention of the part of the designer learns how to and proceeds to widely spreading false claims about COVID vaccines in the population in a systematic manner. Now, by definition, there is no intention present on the assumption that we don't think that black box AIs have intentions and there is no function there, right? So functions are... There, there, there are a couple of types of functions that one can have. One can have a design function. By the stipulation in this case, there is no design function um, to spread this information. One can have um, an etiological function, so a function that is generated through some sort of benefit feedback loop, whereby you know, do phying generates a benefit, and in virtue of this benefit, uh, phying continues. But that is also not the case by stipulation. Nevertheless, we want to say this is a paradigmatic case of a disinformation campaign it was when AI is spreading a disinformation, right? Here is also a more human case. Say that I'm a trusted journalist in Village V, and I'm the kind of person who is unjustifiably very impressed by there being any scientific disagreement whatsoever on a given topic. Should even the most isolated voices express doubt about the scientific claim, I withhold belief. Against this background, I sincerely report on VTV that there is disagreement in science about climate change and the safety of vaccines. And as a result, whenever V inhabitants encounter expert claims that climate change is happening and vaccines are safe, they hesitate to update accordingly. So I want to say that I spread this information and clearly I didn't do it with any intention to mislead and there is no function to mislead present. Basically, the person that you need to have in mind here is your a garden variety conspiracy theorist, most of these people be, really believe the claims that they're trying to spread. Um, so they are, the intention to mislead is clearly uh, missing uh, in these cases, but we don't want to you know, lose the conspiracy theories from our theory of disinformation. That would be, I think, um, you know, a, a big theoretical loss if we have an account of disinformation that's not able to accommodate the vast majority of the problematic disinformation that's on the market. Slide. All right, so what I've said so far is that the, the, the basically all the conditions in the account of disinformation that we have on the market right now are false, right? Information is factive, thereby disinformation is not a species thereof because disinformation can be false. Uh, this information is also not a species of misinformation because this information can be true. And furthermore, this information need not be intentional nor done with the function to mislead. So we don't know what this information is anymore at this stage if all this thing, all these things that I've said are true, or even if I'm in the ballpark of truth, we're not doing really well. And given you know the, the, the infodemic, as I said, uh, I want to say that this is theoretically quite uh, worrying. So here is my um, my view uh, of this information. Uh, the view is knowledge first, but not in a traditional sense. I'm not just going to tell you that disinforming is uh, you know depriving of knowledge or something like that. Uh, I like more nuanced um, knowledge first accounts where knowledge is still central to our normative affairs in that we explain several notions in terms of knowledge, but not in a uh, simplistic direct um, fashion. So a view that I favor about information, but I will not def defend in this talk because nothing much rests on it. I'm just mentioning it in order for you to understand where I'm coming from, what my background view of information is. Um, the view that I favor is a very uh, kind of uh, broad view. Uh, I call it information as possible knowledge. Uh, on this view, a signal S carries the information that P, if and only if it has the capacity to generate knowledge that P in a suitably situated possible agent. It is a very weak account in that insofar as there is any agent in the logical space in any possible world that can learn from this signal, this signal carries information on this account. Uh, so it doesn't have to do with whether we can here uh, on earth uh, uh, get informed by this signal. It doesn't have to do with you know anybody who's 
you know, roughly like us or in closed possible worlds, if anybody in the model space can learn from this signal, then this signal, on my view, carries information. This is my preferred uh, view. Why do I think this? It seems like a pretty broad account. And I think this because I think that information carries its functional nature up its sleeve. Again, I'm not defending this account in this stroke, but just to give you uh, a hint about why, why I might think so. So I think that very many items carry their functional nature up their sleeve, right? So washing machines, we know what they are. They're things that are supposed to wash and we can, we can see that from how they're called, right? Similarly, digestive systems is a, what, what's a digestive system is a system with a function to digest, right? And what happens, well, it has the capacity to do so in normal conditions. That's what happens when you have a function to fight. You have the capacity to do so in normal conditions. Uh, so I think that information is like that. It is the kind of uh, item that carries its function uh, um, up its sleeve. Uh, so to me, it looks as though information is the kind of thing that can inform, uh, as it were, so that has the capacity to inform in normal conditions, um, thereby I, this account that predicts that information has the function to generate knowledge and the capacity to do so in normal conditions, i.e. given a suitably situated agent. So insofar as there is any suitably situated agent out there in the modal space, uh, that signal carries information for me. Let's change slide. Okay, so what do I think about this information? Well, I talked about the prefix dix quite a bit, this quite a bit, so you will know by now where I stand. I think this information is a counterpart of information, but not in a negation sense. That is misinformation. Is this information is stuff that has the capacity capacity to strip people of knowledge, just like this barring is stripping of the uh, membership of the bar. This informing is stripping um, of knowledge. So it's stuff that has the capacity to generate ignorance to, to fully or partially strip someone of their stat status uh, as a knower. This is very broad. So I, uh, what we're going to see later is that stripping someone of their status as a knower doesn't even need to imply that that person had the status to begin with. You can strip someone on this view of your status as a knower, as a knower by just as it were, increasing the distance from their epistemic status to knowledge. So if someone, for instance, has a justified uh, uh, true belief that doesn't amount uh, to knowledge and you're lowering uh, their evidential status, you introduce maybe some misleading defeat, you count a stripping there of their status as a knower, even though they don't yet have it, merely in virtue of making the distance from their status to the knower uh, longer, basically. So it's in terms, the account is not in terms of knowledge, it's in terms of closeness to knowledge. So then what, what the account is going to say, or the first approximation is something along the lines of this information is ignorance generating content, where X is in this information in a context C, if and only if X is a content unit communicated at C that has a disposition to generate ignorance at C in normal conditions. Again, when I talk about generated ignorance, uh, I don't, you know, talk about generating it in the narrow sense by taking a knower and making them into an non-knower. I meant I am meaning it in any way. Uh, increasing the, the the distance from the status of this particular agent to the status of its no, as it were knowledgeable counterpart. Let's change slides. I was trying to change myself. Um, the the account has a normal condition stipulation in it, and that there's a reason for that, right? So one thing that we don't want is um, counterexamples like the following, uh, say that starting tomorrow, uh, there's a strange uh, magnetic field uh, in Glasgow, such that whenever I assert um, uh, that P, um, which, you know, for all I know is true, uh, the world changes such that now P is false. So whenever, whenever I say anything, now I'm disinforming uh, all of my fellow Glaswegians. Uh, this is the kind of situation that will not um, kind of feature as uh, as properly uh, as a proper counterexample to the view because these are abnormal conditions. Where what I mean by normal conditions is roughly what functionalists mean by normal conditions. I the conditions in which uh, our uh, cognitive uh, machinery has acquired its uh, cognitive uh, functions. Uh, no, notice also that the view is contextualist, um, not about knowledge. 
but about um, this information in that the same communicated content will act differently depending on contextual factors, right? So contextual factors that are going to matter are, for instance, the evidential backgrounds of the audience members, right? So if with one particular type of audience, the, the disposition of generated ignorance might be quite high. So if you take the journalist that we were talking about earlier, if you go and assert, you know, in front of, uh, you know, 12 year old kids, there's disagreement as, as about climate change, given their kind of limited evidential background, uh, the probability of uh, the generated ignorance in this audience is quite high. If you come and assert it in, in a room filled with uh, climate scientists, the disposition to, to disinform them is extremely low. Um, so we need an audience dependent contextualist view uh, of this information. So it's not only evidential backgrounds that are going to matter, right? Shared presuppositions, because shared presuppositions also delivered um, one or another pragmatic implicature. Uh, extant social relations. Um, obviously, the potential for disinforming is going to be higher from trusted sources. Uh, social norms having to do with trusting a particular source or another. Okay. Slide. All right. Now, as I said, when I say generating ignorance, I want to be very careful. I don't mean to say that my, the account only applies to knowers. Um, you can disinform people who have uh, justified true beliefs as well. You can disinform people who have true beliefs. You can disinform people, even people who have justified false beliefs. All right. So what, it, what matters, again, on the account is that you increase the distance between the status of this cognizer and knowledge, right? So the closest, you know, what, what we want is to be as close as possible to knowledge because that's the epistemic, the main epistemic value. And insofar as what you say, a, a content unit that you communicated increases my distance uh, to knowledge, then uh, on this account, it is an ignorance generating piece of content and thereby you may well be disinforming me. So here are ways in which we can disinform in, under this, um, this account. Um, you can, as I said, uh, in a classic manner via spreading content that has the capacity of generating false belief, maybe indeed false content or maybe true content with uh, false implicatures. You can do it via misleading defeat. You can introduce misleading defeat in a community such that now their uh, evidential uh, situation is such that on their total body of evidence, they shouldn't believe that P anymore, uh, but P is true. That's why the defeat is misleading, right? So take, for instance, um, uh, if, if I go tomorrow into a, a, a village in Scotland and I tell everybody uh, that the NHS is out to get them and uh, that's why they're, you know, uh, coming to give them vaccines because they want to uh, make them sick. Uh, and, and say that I'm a trusted uh, testifier, I will have introduced misleading undercutting defeat in the community. NHS comes to give them vaccines. They're going to uh, fail to believe that vaccines are safe. In that way, I will have disinformed these people via misleading defeat. Uh, I can also disinform via content that has the capacity of inducing epistemic anxiety and belief loss. So say that I know something, but then you come and say, are you really, really sure that you're sitting at your desk? Or after all, you might well be a brain in a vat, or obviously this works only in the epistemology class, uh, or something along the lines of, are you really, really sure that this vaccine uh, is working, uh, right? After all, scientists have been wrong in the past. So what is happening in this case is, I like Jonathan Jenkins' Ichikawa way of thinking about them. Um, what is happening is you're falsely implicating that these error possibilities are relevant at the context. So when I go in my epistemology class and I tell them, are you really sure you're not a brain in a vat? What I'm doing is I'm falsely implicating that these are possibilities that are relevant at the context. And it may well be theoretically relevant, but <laughs> that's where the relevance uh, stops. I want to say the same thing happens when you, when you do it on the vaccine uh, topic. You're implying that people need to be sure before taking the vaccine. And unless they are, they shouldn't go ahead. Um, and take it. We can also uh, disinform via confidence defeating disinformation, right? Uh, so it doesn't need to be, again, it doesn't be, need to be about knowledge and it doesn't need to be about full belief either. You can just defeat credence justification. Um, so you might even get to keep knowledge, but 
um, lose the knowledge of probability that p, right? So in a case in which I affect your justification with, with misleading defeat, uh, such that you're still, say that you have a threshold view of knowledge, you are still ab above the threshold. So you still know, but now you have less justification. In cases like this, your knowledge would be more easily uh, lost. So, uh, so I will have this informed you. Um, uh, and finally, the classic way that I started with disinforming by exploiting pragmatic phenomena through assertions carrying false implicatures, introducing false presuppositions, and so on. Let's move the slide. So here is then, let's move towards a more precise account, which we said that we tried uh, a few formulations. So here is a more precise account. Um, on this view, a capacity to generate ignorance in a particular audience will heavily depend on the audience's background evidence and knowledge. Uh, so then here is what it takes for a signal to carry a particular uh, piece of this information for a particular audience. A signal R, on my view, carries this information for an audience A with regard to P, if and only if A's evidential probability that P conditional on R is less than A's unconditional evidential probability that P, and P is true. There's a lot of words and probabilities and letters only to say, if you have evidential support at the particular Uh, you've you've frozen, Mona. Mona, you've frozen. Okay, everyone, we'll just hang in there, and um, presumably either Mona's link will start working again in a minute, or. Uh, We'll have to log her out and log her back in again. Ah, here we go. I'm struggling to start the video again. I need permission from you guys. Uh, Dave. Ira? Yes, uh, right now. It tells me that I can't start the video because the host doesn't allow me. Okay, let's try right now. Perfect. Yeah, thanks. No, I don't have slides anymore. <laughs> How many minutes do I still have, by the way? I don't know what the time situation is. I mean, would for, I mean, you're at least five minutes. Do you, is that enough? You can have a bit longer if you like. It's really up to you. No, 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 that's fine. That's fine. Okay. All right. So let me just go back to the, to the account because I don't know how much you've heard of this. The thought was that the signal carries uh, this information for a particular audience insofar as it has uh, it lowers the evidential probability for a p, for a uh, p where p is true, right? So, if you have an evidential probability, say of 0.8, for a true claim p, and I come and lower it for you via misleading defeat or false implicatures or whatever uh, other way that uh, I might do it, I will have this informed you. So, as soon as you have a particular um, level of epistemic support, and I do something to lower it, I disinform you. Insofar as the relevant claim is true, let's change slides. So why do I think that? This is from my previous work. You don't need to endorse uh, my previous work, although it would be good because it's the correct uh, view uh, of evidence and defeat. Um, so the reason why I think that is the case is because on my account, evidence is um, consists of facts that you're in a position to know and that increase your evidential probability, while defeaters consist of facts that you're in a position to know and that decrease your evidential probability. So you can see how this is a kind of a nice and coherent a uh, big picture uh, where evidential probability raisers are evidence, evidential probability lowerers are defeaters, and this information works via lowering evidential uh, probabilities in one way or another, um, depending on the, the method uh, 
as I said, I, the taxonomy that I tried to offer earlier on is by all means not a full taxonomy, but those are a few ways in which we, you can do this. Uh, you might think, well, isn't this a bit too broad? Being in a position to know seems to be a wide notion. On my view, it's very restricted. So it's a in that way is a non-ideal epistemology in that what I'm talking about is actual cognizers rather than idealized cognizers. So what matters for me is what you know, what's humanly feasible uh, to know with all human limitations. You know, we can't, we have quantitative limitations. We can't know all arithmetical truths. We can have qualitative limitations. We, you know, can't see through walls uh, and so on. So what my theory is not concerned with ideal cognizers, uh, which is why I have this notion of being in a position to know um, at the core of my, my view of evidence, defeat, and disinformation. So the thought is that I'm, I'm a human cognizer with normal human capacities. Uh, there's a bunch of facts uh, lying around me that I'm in a position to know because my cognitive capacity can do it, can, where can is limited by these quantitative and qualitative limitations. Um, and I could come and form my beliefs based on this um, awesome evidence that I have. But then you come, what you do is you come um, and you lower my degree of uh, evidential probability in one way or another uh, via your disinforming content. That's the view. So let's change slide. So notice, notice a few, a few uh, things about this account. This information is the stuff that undermines what status as a knower, but again, not in the sense that you need to have it to begin with, but in the sense that it makes the distance from the status that you do end up having and knowledge um, bigger than it used to be, right? It decreases evidential probability, therefore you're further away from knowledge. So what this information does, it lowers the evidential probability for P, uh, i.e. the probability on the p-relevant uh, facts that they're in a position to know for a true proposition. And it can do so by merely communicating semantically or pragmatically that non-p, when in fact uh, p is the case, or it can do so by partially or fully defeating a's justification for p, uh, a's belief that p is the case, or a's confidence uh, in p. Let's change slides. Now on this view, here are a few interesting results that I take to be features rather than bugs. Uh, one and the same piece of communication can at the same time be, i.e. carry uh, a piece of information and a piece of disinformation, right? Remember that I have this very broad account of information whereby a signal can carry information insofar as there's any person in the in the logical space then can take it up and be informed by it, right? So it is of course possible given that information is, such, my account of information is so broad or my account of this information is so context dependent that at a particular context, there's a piece of uh, content that constitutes this information because of the, uh, you know, evidential backgrounds of the audience while at the same time, there's a possible person in, uh, in the modal space or even in the actual world that can be informed by it, uh, right? Um, so, uh, this, I, I take this to be a feature, not a bug. I take it to be the case that, you know, it's just a classic slogan, tailor your uh, speech to your audience, right? Sometimes, uh, you know, I can, uh, with, with the same claim, I can disinform someone who's maybe less well-informed about the topic while at the same time asserting something true and thereby informing their neighbor who are more informed about, uh, the relevant, uh, topic, right? Um, I think another good feature of the account is that it allows that this information for an audience A can exist in the absence of is actually hosting the relevant belief or credence. Um, so again, this account of this information acts on the evidential environment, not on the doxastic, so not on the psychology. Why do I think that's important? Well, because the most dangerous disinformation campaign are not targeting believers, they're, tra they're targeting people who are already epistemically anxious, right? So you, you have a community that already doesn't know whether to trust the NHS, because to be frank, the NHS has a horrible background when it comes to treating, um, you know, historically disadvantaged communities. So you have a community that already doesn't know whether to trust um, the NHS, so they don't really form the beliefs based on the NHS flyers about vaccines. You come and introduce even more uh, defeat in that community, you count as having disinformed them because now they have an even more polluted epistemic environment that they started off with. And this is independent of any doxastic attitude they may have, right? The point is that now they have less of uh, availability of information as it were. So they're even less likely to form the right credence uh, or belief. Uh, 
So another important feature of the view is that partial defeat of epistemic support that one is in a position to know is enough for this information, right? So in this way, this information targeting the already epistemically vulnerable um, is, uh, is a, you know, an important species uh, of disinformation on my account. Let's change slides. So that's, if that's right, and even if it's not, if, even if it's only, you know, very roughly on the right track, at least on the writer track than the account uh, that we had until now, uh, I want to say um, the practical stakes are high here uh, and there's a lot of work to be done. So notice that we started with the classical notion of this information. Well, here's the thing. Fact-checking, all of our fact-checking habits are relying on the classical notion. And when I say fact-checking habits, I mean starting with fact-checking -check companies and finishing with extraordinarily sophisticated fact-checking AIs that have been produced in the latest years by my colleagues in computer science. So all of these devices are going to track at best only false content. And that is hardly the problem. As I said, uh, disinforming via outright false content is not the subtler way to do it, is not the best way to do propaganda, indeed is the least dangerous because it is, the, you know, there's far less people who are vulnerable to such a straightforward, unsubtle uh, strategy, right? And we are, you know, pretty good at judging uh, and, you know, navigating the world epistemically. So if you're going to come with blatant falsehoods in front of your audience, the likelihood of disinforming them is going to be much lower than if you do it a bit more subtly. So what I've argued for is that this information is not a type of information. Disinforming is not a way of informing. And while information is content with knowledge generating potential, this information is content with the disposition to generate ignorance in normal conditions at the context at stake. Uh, and the, the upshot of this, I want to say, is that this information is much more ubiquitous and harder to track than it is currently taken to be in policy and practice, right? So as I said, mere fact checkers uh, that are now tracking false assertions just won't do. We need to, what we need to do is train an AI in epistemology, basically, and that seems hard, right, to, tra to track things like misleading defeat and pragmatic phenomena. Now, Whenever I give this talk, people seem terrified at the thought that we need to teach uh, AIs how to track misleading defeat. But in conversations with my colleagues in computer science, it turns out that actually it's not that hard uh, because AIs uh, partic in particular are very good at, um, are le at learning from instances. You just feed them some instances and then you give them positive or negative feedback when they propose an instance of this information. Apparently, they learn extremely uh, quickly. In particular, my colleagues in computer science tell me that um, feeding an AI a bit of Gricean theory should be absolutely trivial. If at least we manage to do that, we, we're not going to capture everything that I call uh, disinformation, but I think we're going to ca capture the vast majority thereof because I think that uh, in, in most walks of life, that's how uh, disinformation is being spread via false implicature. But yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Mona. That was excellent. All right. So, yeah. We got through all the technical, technical difficulties. <laughs> I soldiered through them. <laughs> so um, I think what we're going to do for questions, um, people, if people want to raise hands, and I think I think I will see their hands raised. So I'll give people a moment to sort of think. I'll, I'll ask a question while people think about their, formulate their questions and work out how to raise hands, and then we'll work out uh, how to do this. I think we can bring them in the room. So that's the idea. We'll bring them in the room and they can ask their question. Uh, a quick thing I want to ask, just a clarificatory thing. Um, your accounts of information and disinformation, as I, as I get it, they seem to be to some like to some degree uh, success notions. And what I mean by that is, you in order to, like for example, someone who is really bad at disinforming wouldn't succeed in disinforming at all, right? So if they are like someone they're trying to disinform, but they're so bad at it that no one would pay any attention to them, they wouldn't form false beliefs, etc. Then that wouldn't, on your view, I just to check that doesn't count disinformation, right? No. The mere intent and so on. I mean, that sounds plausible disinformation because it looks like it looks like it's something so bad that it ceases to be the kind of thing that it's trying to be. You know, I wonder though how it works with knowledge. Um, so information as being sort of putting you in a position to know, because it looks like there might be cases there where the success idea doesn't work so well. Like imagine like some future, like some advanced civilization come down and they give us this bank of information. Like, and it's stored somewhere and they say, look, you're not gonna understand it yet. 
but you know sometime soon when you reach a certain point in your civilization this will all make sense and it kind of feels like that's a body of you know we have excellent grounds that there's a there's a, there's a bank of information there but of course it, it, in, in normal circumstances for us it's not knowledge generating because we're just not re ready yet and i guess yeah. you'd have to say that's not information but i, I don't know what no, so my account, my account is weird in that way, and that is as asymmetrical. So my account of information is much broader than my account of disinformation. So the account of information says that insofar as a signal can generate knowledge in anybody in the logical space, then it is information. So even if the aliens come and put it in the uh, in the uh, whatever. Um, in their back room uh, and leave it there and we can't yet understand what's going on insofar as there's someone there that can understand in the logical space that can understand what's going on that that's its information now th there is a question as to whether you can reconstruct your case such that there's no one in the logical space uh, and and I'm, I'm wondering how to do that I struggle because I to me, it looks as though the logical space is not our under our control. Insofar as you can already, if we can imagine that person, they're already there in the logical space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I mean that, 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 that. I think the reason why the account is so asymmetrical, where this information, as you well put it, is to some extent a success notion. While, but it's a success notion at the context, right? So it's a success notion about a particular audience of the particular context. While information, while also being a success notion is a much has much broader success conditions in that insofar as there's any imaginable creature that can come to know uh then that's uh information and the reason why why i like it in this way is because because of because information and and, uh, and this information in virtue of not being the negation of each other they don't need to have uh symmetry indeed it would be a bad result if it were to be symmetrical uh, so information and misinformation need to be symmetrical because misinformation just is false information, as it were, the false variety. Um, yeah. But but this information is something else, is robbing people of information, as it were. So then you should expect uh, the asymmetry. Yeah, yeah. No, excellent. I completely agree with that point. I interestingly, the debate about fake news, there are people who think that fake news is a variety of news. <laughs> which is the same, the same point, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So well, uh, uh, we'll have to check if people. Uh, uh, there are no hands are appearing yet, and I wonder if there's some structural problem. That, you know, there's some technical glitch preventing hands to go up. But let me just ask something else while that we're waiting on that. Um, I was thinking, like, also with this is a friendly point about it. Disinformation. You're talking about um, um, you're talking about vulnerabilities and epistemic vulnerabilities and so forth. And it struck me that, like, there's on your view there's kind of like two levels of this there's like direct disinformation but you can also have a kind of structural disinformation where you sort of create the conditions to propagate disinformation you know that that would like because because it's a very contextual yeah. right and there could be ways yeah. in which it generates circumstances in which people are more vulnerable to disinformation yeah let me write this down just a second that's very helpful thanks a lot let me write it down yeah, that's right. So that's another that's something that I should discuss in my taxonomy. That's very important because you don't need to bring in the, the piece of content. You can just you can just create the structure for it to be generated and then walk away. Uh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, yeah, but also like I mean, on your view, it's like a big advantage. You could talk about how because we've got this context element, context sense development to disinformation, people who go about generating context for the propagation of disinformation, they're also in the kind of the practice of propagating disinformation without doing it directly you know yeah uh, that's right yeah so i think the account can accommodate it but i think i should explicitly discuss this case because it's an interesting case and it, it, there are probably going to be more varieties of this kind of indirect way of doing it that doesn't need to that don't need to go via structures um you know what i mean so it, it might be it depends on what you think of social norms are if you think they're structures then then the same thing but it might be possible to generate it by just populating an environment with particular social norms like do your own research <laughs> you know <Yeah. laughs> just <laughs> plug in that yeah, stuff yeah. <laughs> and then leave and see what <laughs> happens behind you you know <laughs> yeah i yeah. mean that, that's interesting because you know like because what they do is not so much do your own research but that like you know if if you're a patriot do your own research or something yeah. like that, well, that <laughs> right, it's yeah. in there you know uh yeah i mean another friendly thought i had was um that you talk about um you, you cash this out in terms of ignorance and i wonder i mean i can see that's kind of a, like an attractive handle to give to it. I, I wonder if that's quite the right word you want or whether it, it sort of adds noise you don't need i mean for one thing 
you know, as you say, it, it doesn't need to be knowledge precluding, right? Disinformation. It just needs to lower your credences. That would be enough. So on most views, that wouldn't even put it in the market for ignorance. The other problem is, of course, there are views of ignorance, which ignorance is more than just lack of knowledge. You've got to lack true belief or something like that. I know. And I think your view is correct for what it's worth. Your, your view of knowledge, I think, of ignorance, I think is correct. Um, oh, yeah. And I was going to say the other issue is like ignorance has like a normative dimension. You might think, well, a lot of these cases, people aren't really culpable. So, you know. We wouldn't yeah, really no, I mean, I, so, so I agree with your view with your view of ignorance. Uh, I, I mean, I've, I've wondered in the past whether your view is correct about the nature of ignorance or about the ignorance attributions. I've always I've kind of had a, a question about that in my mind that I actually want to talk to you about it when we see each other next time. Uh, because, of course, you can try to explain this kind of normative dimension, which is clearly there in pragmatic terms, right? Well, if it's not relevant to this context, why are you calling me ignorant of the, you know, number of uh, grains of sand? So it's offensive. <laughs> I mean, it's true, strictly speaking, but offensive. So you can cash it out either having to do with the nature of ignorance or having to do with ignorance, propriety of ignorance attribution. Uh, so I... Uh, eventually, I think that you're right. That is the nature of of ignorance uh, that uh, uh, that's normative because it it seems to me as though uh, you know, insofar as it's it's pragmatic, it should be dismissible somehow. But it doesn't seem to be dismissible in any way. Um, and I I agree with you that in a way it's noise to cash it in terms of ignorance because it, knowledge and ignorance have little to do with what I'm talking about. Basically, I'm cashing it in terms of just lowering uh, evidential status. Roughly, that the correct way to put it would be lowering evidential status. Um, but uh, so the reason why I'm cashing it in terms of ignorance is because I, I want to start with an intuitive point and then work my way. Uh, towards yeah. the precise account, but maybe that's what well, maybe I should say that explicitly. Maybe I should say, well, the first approximation is generating ignorance, but actually, if we look closer to it, what it is is lowering, um, lowering one's uh, epistemic status. And, and notice that I. So I'm wondering what you think about this. Do you think that this information also has this normative dimension? So you think that if you come and lower my epistemic status about something that I shouldn't know to begin with. Don't is that still this information or not? What what's sorry for asking you oh, a question? Yeah, <laughs> the I mean, around it that. That, isn't it? Because you might think that um so so one just one quick thought. You, you said ignorance, you might say epistemic harm or something like that, maybe some notion like that. And then the the, the thought about like whether whether these kind of cases always involve whether uh, you know epistemic undermining. So it's, it's not true that epistemic undermining is always disinformation. That direction of fit doesn't go right because. It could be that maybe we're over, we're all overconfident or something like that, and and we should all learn to be like sort of Peronian skeptic type people, and that we, you know, because I mean the Peronian skeptics are cashed out; they care about the truth. They care about the truth so much, you know, it's like a permanent inquiry. That's why they don't believe anything, <laughs> you know. So you might think this. So there could be lines like that, you know, not thinking of the skeptic as someone who's trying to play games with us, but the skeptic is trying to help us to be kind of intellectually humble or something, sort of Montaigne type uh, skeptic. Or Hume or someone like that. Um, yeah, so I yeah, I wonder, but it seems like the, the, the difference though is that they're, they're not in the game of epistemic harm. The disinformation people are in the game of epistemic harm. Like they're trying yeah. to help you. They want you to they want to, to lower your epistemic confidence in a way when you shouldn't. Um yeah, that's right. I mean, one thing to say, the main problem that this account has, to put it straight on the table, is that it's too broad. So I'm, I move from a false account to, I, I gather that, you know, you trust me that at least to some extent that the classical account is false. Uh, and I moved, you know, to, I was left with nothing. So I need to build an account of, out of complete scratch. And I, I know what I've done. I built too broad an account. That's what I've done. We had too narrow an account. And now we have too broad an account because everything that defeats is now this information. And of course, you might just come and tell me one day, Mona is raining. And it's true that it's raining. Uh, with the point, with all the good intentions to, you know, advise me to take the umbrella, but without knowing that here is my evidential background. I'm having, I'm supposed to have lunch with Mary tomorrow, and I know that Mary hates the rain. So now that you tell me that it's raining tomorrow, I'm going to start believing, um, you know, with higher credence that Mary is not coming to lunch. And by my account, you will have at the same time informed me and disinformed me because now you inform me that it's raining, but you disinform me about whether Mary is coming or not. And it seems like telling you that you just disinform me seems like a bad thing. So the account seems too, too broad. So, you know, I, that I'm going to have to somehow narrow down with something like your normative account of ignorance, something in the vicinity of that, with something that, you know, the, the speaker should have known that that's, that that's going to create some harm or something like that. Because 
or some relevance condition or something like that, because I don't want to say, I mean, every truth that I assert has a huge, you know, likelihood of disinforming someone on both a completely irrelevant topic, right? So, um, you know, I think I, I was thinking about this. I think that the source of the worry there is because of, normally you would do it by appealing to intentions or design features or something. So normally you would say, look, it's not just any old kind of thing that does this. It's things that are designed to have these like deleterious effects. Because you don't want that, because you want the AI, you can think of AI type cases that don't have it. Yeah, and the conspiracy well, theorists, I think we should just shouldn't lose the conspiracy theorists who really doesn't have the intention. I think it's important to keep him and it's, we're better off having to broaden account. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, so the conspiracy, yeah, that's a I mean, I was going to say, well, you know, maybe like a thought might be, you don't need the intention, you don't need the systemic intention or something like that, or the design feature that you're trying to mislead or anything, but you, but insofar as you don't have anything like that, if there's an intention to, if the intentions as it were are good, if there are intentions and they're good, that that will somehow suffice to take it out of being disinformation. But I guess that won't work as the conspiracy theory case because they are- Yeah, good. that's the problem. So that's why I'm thinking that something like your kind of normative restriction uh, that you impose on ignorance might work. So in cases in which I should have known that when I served that P, I will disinform you, then it is disinformation. In case in which I had absolutely no way to know that now that I tell you that it's raining, uh, you're going to end up not going to lunch with Mary. Um, so something like that, I'm thinking, it might do the truth, the, the work. Of course, that is good, just going to be as much trouble for me as it is for you, because now we don't have reduction. We're ending up in the normative <laughs> reality, <laughs> you know. Uh, but yeah, uh, I, I think something like that's got to be true. But for what it's worth, I think for you know for for our efforts to track this information, it's better to have to broaden account than than to narrow an account, right? Let and then uh, you know I, I was talking to my uh, to my colleagues in computer science how we we would would we even go about uh, producing a fact checker now with this disastrous paper that you wrote? And my thinking is well, first we need to figure out which ones are the most dangerous. Uh, ways of disinforming. And that's also going to be audience dependent. Some audiences are going to be more vulnerable to religious speech. Some other audiences are going to be more vulnerable to skeptical speech and so on, right? So we just need to do more research. It's not as easy as, you know, we're just going to build a fact check and it's going to work for everybody everywhere in the world. Um, but I think, again, as I said, I think that if we at least build an AI that understand Grice, understands Grice, we will have made huge progress in tracking this information, even if we never manage to train the AI to understand defeat. Yeah. I can imagine, though, the AI, if, if like, you'd have to train it to either err on the side of caution or on the side of liberality, because... Like because of all the context stuff going on, like if it's if it's too cautious, then it's going to start closing down things it shouldn't close down, right? Yeah, it won't be sensitive to, and so yeah, But if it's too liberal, then it's going to start letting in, and, that, and that's going to be the really tricky thing of how to get it to have that kind of sensitive. I mean, so that's yeah. hard enough for humans to do. Let alone, yeah, it is, and it's it's going to come with usual ethical problems because it looks like it's censoring a particular variety of content for particular audiences, but not for other audiences, right? Yeah. And it is de facto what it would be doing. Um, uh, you know, it, I want to say that that's the kind of, of you know, uh, paternalism that we need to exercise on occasion about smoking and disinformation equally. Okay, great. Ah, hand. So that's good. I was starting to worry that the feature wasn't working. Uh, Eric, can we back here? We've got S. Aaron James has got a question. We're going to bring him in. I don't know whether we can see you, but can we hear you, Aaron? You want to speak? you're muted ah okay there that's me yeah, yeah okay you hear me now. thanks a lot um so I, I should preface this well so let me say the real per, per the preface this by saying that i i tuned in late and i was driving and i couldn't look at the slides or i checked in something like at stoplights and then but now i've heard this discussion like um since i've been back so i'm pay, and paying attention but um, but uh, but aside from that, the the account of disinformation looks really wonderful. I mean, in light of the, it looks way better than than the standard sort of views. So it's uh, that's really wonderful. So if nothing else, that's my comment. If, but I do have a question of clarification that you might have already addressed. But in light of uh, so it, so disinformation doesn't require intent or failure of function. I get all those points. But then you're still there's still a question of what makes for the difference between disinformation and misinformation. Right, and then Duncan went, and then one suggest the suggestion hobbled by the conspiracy theorist is something like, well, um, misinformation is somebody who's trying to, sort of and trying and succeeding well enough in doing in informing somebody, 
but they're they're falling sh they're they're fall short. Um, but then that doesn't work because the conspiracy theorist is trying to inform people of things. Yeah. They're just they're falling short. They do count as in trying to inform. Uh, but I thought there. So just tell me why can't you just say that they're not trying to really inform a, a conspiracy theorist is you know who's pitching JFK a, a new theory about why JFK was assassinated. They're not trying to inform people about uh, the conspiracy. They are trying to inform people with particular factual claims. There's particular pieces of information, of factual claims that may or may not be information, and those could be informative or disinformative. But the conspiracy in general is is something else. It's and you might say that it doesn't really reach. It doesn't really qualify as a, an attempt to inform the way like yeah, a journalist is attempting to inform. That's really and then cool. A journalist, but yeah, a journalist so that, that is attempting to inform but falls short. But falls short is doing journalism, but they're just doing bad journalism. Um, they are misinforming because they're like they're far enough. But the conspiracy theory, just despite making some assertions, you know, is is not in on the enterprise of informing uh, people well enough. Yeah, so that's cool. That would basically be a disjunctivism about trying to inform, right? Okay, yeah. <laughs> you're not even in the business of trying to inform in so far, in so far as what you're spreading, uh, you know, doesn't have the right kind of epistemic qualities uh, as it yeah. were. So the, the good case and the bad case might be indistinguishable, but as a matter of fact, uh, they are different. <laughs> and one of them is a, an attempt to inform, the other one isn't. Uh, that's really well, cool. That helps, yeah, yeah, it helps explain why people can't tell the difference in a lot of cases. But I mean, and, and, yeah. and there are ways of describing what the conspiracy theorists of doing is like, you're not really trying to, you're not really trying to inform people. You're just like ginning up, ginning up possibilities or you're sowing doubt or, you know, you're doing, there's a way of describing what they're doing that does actually fit what they're doing, you know. You're saying like that sort of um, you, you can say all that stuff about what they're doing without honoring them as, <laughs> as trying to do information <laughs> and trying yeah, to inform right. people. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So you might you can even think, you know, like these people who who talk about um, who have this kind of functionalist views on on indicative speech acts where they're thinking that there's this kind of uh, feedback between hearers and speakers that that explains why we still have the practice of assertion whereby I'm saying that P and with the intention for you to believe that P and then you believe it and that's what makes me continue asserting because if you never believed it I would stop asserting um and so so maybe that the the thought can be that actually nobody's trying to inform people are, are just trying to make other people believe something and in some cases those uh. those those tryings um, to be to make people believe are attempts at informing in virtue of the quality of the of the signal. While in other cases they're not attempts at informing because the quality of the signal doesn't qualify or something like that. Yeah. Uh, or or maybe the the way in which the assertion is produced is not is highly irregular or or something like that. Um, so that would be, as it were, a way to justify having uh, a disjunctivism about this. But I like it. This, this I love okay, yeah. disjunctivist views because they're so they're so counterintuitive. <laughs> <laughs> I find them really cool. <laughs> I mean, well, just to elaborate, like you might then take journalism as a kind of paradigm case of trying to inform. You know, because it is even if it fails, it's trying to inform. It's not necessarily trying to get people to believe something. It's not checking whether that what they believe asserting things, seeing if they still believe, and then asserting it again. It's 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 doing something else. Like it's trying to inform people. Yeah. And, and that, when that's it, in terms, when it in terms fails. That, yeah. That's in terms of function. You can spell that out in terms of function of the okay. practice. It's plausible. Yeah. 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 yeah that's, that's certainly true. like what the norms of professionalization are all, all are all about. You know, like you can, you know, as a as a practice, um, as a professionalized practice, that's it does have yeah, yeah, you can explain its function in that way and, art and, and rationalize that um, yeah. in light of the structure. Yeah, yeah, so this is cool. I need to think about this uh, a bit more because it would be good if I could, you know, narrow it down a tiny bit. I mean, as I said to Duncan, I'm, I'm not that desperate about how broad the account is, but I would like, you know, better responses to the to the broadness objection than the one that I the ones that I have now. And this this does seem like a like a much better way to go and much cooler uh, to begin with. And I think it's you know it's a cool research thing to think about to begin with, if you see what I mean, separately from the the account itself about whether attempts whether whether this when these people speak they even count as attempts at informing or not. Yeah. Cool. Thanks very much, Aaron. Yeah, I, I, I'm just wondering, just like this exchange, you know, like how many parallels there are between 
th this kind of debate and the debate about fake news and whether there are any disparallels. So, you know, disanalogy. So, um, so, so one thought you might have about fake news is the, and you might have, so uh, fake news versus news. You might think it's the nature of news. It's got to be designed to inform. It can't just be like that. That's, it can't just be the sort of thing that's informative and just sort of rises, you know, like, that lots of things are in, like the rings on a tree are informative and things like that. that's not news right you know yeah. even if it's like surprising information or something it, that doesn't make it news right it seems like it's going to be something structurally about it being an intent to inform and relatedly with fake news it seems like there's going to be some intent like the news element it's like it's trying to pass itself off as news so there's going to be some kind of intent or design or something functional thing uh I mean, now I'm starting to doubt that. But like, if, if that were true, then that would be like a, a relevant disanalogy between these kind of cases and the information, disinformation cases. Yeah. They kind of do come free of sort of functions and intentions and so on. But now I'm starting to doubt that even. I'm starting to wonder, you know what I mean? Well, I mean, look, just because, so here's one thing to say. So, that, so, so fake news, you might think, is a species of this information. Uh, but of course, species can have properties that the type doesn't have. Right, that's why they're particular species rather than another. Right, so it might be that fake news is intentionally spread disinformation uh, or something like that, uh, or or maybe that's strong, but whatever. You see what I mean? So maybe the fake news can have an intention, even though it's a species of disinformation, um, be in virtue of that, just having just being a, a species property, uh, as it were. But I'm 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 also not sure that it that it's there. Maybe we need to think more about what makes news into. Um, more than just uh, three rings, Be because it does, there does seem to be there something there um, that's more than. I mean, I completely agree that it's it's got to be more to it. Um, but what the? Yeah, no, I'm just yeah. thinking like a case like the case you had in mind, like a, an AI just takes it upon itself to start, you know, announcing things. <laughs> but now, <laughs> like if if they do well, like it's it's news, and if they do badly, then it could be fake news. Um, I don't know. That, uh, my intuitions aren't so clear there. I was kind of thinking that wasn't possible. Now I'm starting to wonder. Yeah, maybe because it's presented. I mean, it's got to, in, or, in order for it to be more like news than like tree rings, this AI is going to have to present it in a news kind of type fashion, right? So maybe, maybe we can say that it's... Um, you know that is not really news. It just it just seems to be news, right? Yeah. So maybe we can get out of it like that. But but I agree with you. I mean, this black box AI thing is basically a, a recipe for dismissing all uh, analysis that have intention and function in them. <laughs> you know, plug plug in the black box AI, and you need to delete intention and function from your analysis of pretty much anything. <laughs> It sort of feels like there ought to be like a more a broader notion of function which could capture these kind of cases. Like, like the AI isn't acting randomly, right? Presumably in these cases. We so don't, know. <laughs> That's <laughs> we don't know. That's true. We don't know. <laughs> uh, I mean, there is a comments function notion. So um, the comments function notion is the simplest on the market, where it's, it has to do only basically with what a particular trait does in the organism with what a particular piece does in your whatever laptop or something like that so it's a causal view basically if that's what you know my heart does then that's what its function is uh the thought about this is that it doesn't imply any normativity that's why people don't like this view of functions because it seems false in that it predicts that it's never the case that my heart my heart can malfunction or properly function which seems to be a problem um but I, I mean, I don't mind that view that much. Uh, and it is much uh, weaker in that now that that's what the AI does in our social system, then that's what its function is. But you can think of, see how it's such a thin notion then that everything is a function now, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, um, you know, I have, a, I have a little napkin here. The function of this napkin is to be on my table now. <laughs> you know, it's a bit... You can get functions, but it's just not very a very explanatory notion anymore. If it's just this kind of causal uh, thing, um, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. Aaron, do you have another question. You want to come back in the room? Can we bring him in, Aaron. Sorry, I hit the wrong button. <laughs> mute button. Uh, yeah, sir. I was just going to say in this connection that you can think of you don't think of journalism as an act that's trying to inform 
And then there's a problem there because black box AI, you know, might do do something facially the same thing without the intent. You can think of journalism as in the first instance a practice. And then journalists are they're only doing journalism, they're all by acting sort of within the practice, approximating its norms and stuff. But but the norms of journalism has a has purposes, the purposes to inform. And that that purpose rationalizes norms in the first instance. So it's you know uh, it's it does have a function, but it's it's sort of as it were a collective a function over a set of activities and a set of norms that that sort of designed with a whole you know bunch of procedures um, to to achieve a an informing result. Um, no, uh, I mean the, the practice of journalism we can get functions really easily because it is plausible that we designed it. Yeah. So you know, over time, people right as a collective kind of enterprise. Uh, that's but then right. the only, an act of journalism only happens because it's then per, uh, uh, sort of working within the practice, acknowledging the standards, you know, to some, or at least in some sense, being disposed to be accountable to those standards. Yeah, right? that's, a li so, that's actually a live question in, in um, theory, in, in media studies theory. So we, we just had a, a conference in applied epistemology for young, young researchers at Glasgow. And there was a former journalist who's now doing their PhD at uh, St. Andrews uh, and who came to, to tell us actually, uh, so she, was, she was putting forth a, an account of proper journalistic practice. Um, and her account was so constitutive that it would, it seemed to follow that very many, you know, that Fox News is not uh, is not part of the journalist profession, and, and neither is the Daily Mail. And and they were saying that they're comfortable with that. That that's an assumption in the field that this just isn't journalism. The problem is not that it's bad journalism; is that there isn't journalism. And the reason why they like to think that is because they think that there's got to be some norms that are constituting this practice because it is a socially constructed practice so it's going to have constitutive norms so you know something like at least aim to inform uh, it's got to be a constitutive norm and if you're daily mail and you, you breach it you know all the time systematically intentionally indeed when you wake up in the morning that's what you mean to do to breach this norm you don't count at some point as playing the game anymore just like you know if i start saying mama 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 i don't count as speaking english anymore because i'm plotting too many norms right or if i play with my hands i don't count as playing football anymore so there are just you know norms that if you break too systematically and that if they are too central to the game you fail to to play the game, which is norm constituted. That's, so that's what journalists want to say about this. Uh, kind well, that, of that, seem, that seems right to me, but the case of Fox News is is what makes it distinctive is that it's kind of hovering inter, intermediate between sort of propaganda or editorialism and journalism. So it's, it's doing sort of enough things to sort of count as participating in the practice of journalism. It'll show some accountability, fact checking. And, uh, you know, if somebody points out a mistake, they'll maybe some acknowledgement of the standards but then they're also blurring and fudging enough of them also that so they're they're sort of hovering this middle intermediate space. All oh, right. Well, so that's very like yeah. News well, I'm not familiar with the phenomenon. Sorry. But <laughs> yeah, well, Newsmax we, and some of, yeah, yeah. some of these other organizations. Yeah, none of these other some of these other organizations are just patently propaganda with just the appearance of the appearance of journalism. And if you say that's if you write them and say that's that's false or it's pointed out or that's a mistake, then they won't issue a correction or they won't even show worried about. It. They'll just go like you know, wink. Yeah, yeah, we know. <laughs> you know, this is this Why is that's, print? Yeah. Yeah. So that's pure fake news. And then Fox is is, I mean, the whole strategy of why it works to get the credibility of journalism, and so, but then pass off and be influential, you know, with propaganda or, you know, or color, depending on the degrees of things. And it's sort of parasitic on journalism that way. But it does. But they do keep some real journalists still, for example, in the institution. Um, I mean, even the even when they called elect, they got in big trouble. For example, um, during the Trump uh, last Trump election, because th th their their forecaster, they wanted a really reliable forecaster. They hired someone who just had great skills at that. The guy was a Democrat, a Democrat, and then he looked at Arizona, just looked at the numbers, and he's like, Arizona is going to go for Biden. So he so he has tells Fox call Arizona for Biden instead of Trump. And that was a disaster from a publicity point of view. I mean, the viewers were like really outraged about this, never forgave Fox for this, you know, like it was a ratings mess, you know, like, but the, like, why did they even do that? Well, it's because for all their propagandizing, they are still trying to have a hand in journalism. So they, their success comes from sort of what, right. being close enough to journalism to sort of be show, if, if not just compliance, accountability to the, nor to the norms of journalism, but then also, you know, fairly yeah. flagrantly violating them. 
or, yeah, so or I, think the I think the functionalist view will probably be able to deal with this case quite quite neatly, I was thinking, because so the, the functionalist view, it doesn't even need to be the design function. Uh, because, you yeah. know, these design functions are very accidental. Who knows what the person who first created Fox News had in mind? And why does that even matter, given the state of <laughs> play, <laughs> right? Um, but you have these etiological functions that are supposed to um, map on to what keeps the, the entity going. So what contributes to its continuous existence? So the etiological function of my heart is pumping blood because that's what explains why I still have a heart. The thought is that pumping blood is good for me and my organism's existence is good for the heart because that's how it stays alive. So that's why its function is pumping blood rather than ticking, which doesn't have the same effect as it were. Um, so similarly, the function person can come and say, look, uh, in the case of Fox News, it's still journalist because it doesn't break enough of these norms. So it's not, you know, football playing with your hands. Uh, but it's kind of just playing football and, you know, faulting a lot or something like that. Um, but it, its function is actually not um, to inform. So it is it is journalism in normative terms in that, it, you know, it meets the main norms of the practice, but its function is not an informative one uh, because what keeps Fox News alive is not the fact that on occasion uh, they inform truly about Arizona. What keeps it alive is, you know, it's, particular audience, which, you know, is not there in order to find out about <laughs> the truth, right? So it would seem as though, you know, on any functional account that predicts that the benefit that you produce and that keeps you alive is what explains your function. Um, as yeah. far as I can tell, both for Fox News, I guess, it is, I'm not really a specialist. And here in the UK, the, the market is much simpler. You just have the baddies and the goodies. It's very easy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, as far as I can tell, the functionalist account is going to be able to explain uh, Fox News away in that in that sense. Yeah, sounds like it. That's great. Well, thanks very much. Uh, that we, we're out of time, um, but um, that was a really great talk, Mona. Thank you. That was really interesting. Thank so, you so much for the discussion. This was very helpful. I'm, uh, can I email you uh, about that that bit that we discussed um, about yes, how? Please, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll send you an email uh, because I, I really would like th this. This paper is very close to publication. It's at proofs level, and I would like to fix the account because before I send the proofs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <that's good>. yeah. <laughs> thanks a lot for having me. Yeah. No. Th thanks. And if we just thank 